Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Walt Disney World Q&A. This is the series in which I seem to change the title every episode, but it involves the words Disney and Q&A. But the idea is every week you guys give me questions regarding Disney, whether it's about the parks, the movies, the toys, the rides, you name it. And I try to give you answers to the best of my abilities. This week we are here at Epcot on MC Magic, the one-to-one -one scale recreation of the Walt Disney World uh, in Minecraft. And we've got a bunch of people here and we're going to take a little strolling tour around Epcot while we answer some questions. So let's just dive right in, why don't we? Um, first question comes from Can the Man, who asks, Hey Rob, quick question for this week's episode. What land sex slash section in any park do you think should be expanded? In other words, what land do you think deserves more space to work with, has plenty of potential to expand, and could produce some new attractions that you would enjoy? Keep in mind, do not answer the question off of what is your favorite land, but instead focus on potential of expansion. Personally, I would choose Pixar Place. Pixar has produced some of Disney's most recognized films, and I could see some great attractions coming out of that area of Hollywood Studios. Sorry for the long question again, but I hope you can fit it in. Uh, great, great question. Um, I think you're spot on with Pixar Place, but I don't want to steal that answer, but I think that's a great one. I think my other answer is in Hollywood Studios, and I think that is, uh, wow, I'm totally, oh, uh, the Muppets area, right? That was actually originally intended to be a whole part of the park, but unfortunately there were a lot of falling outs with uh, Jim Hansen's uh, estate at the time, and so essentially all we ended up getting was Muppet Vision 3D. Now Disney owns the Muppets, why not expand on that? I mean, you're rebooting, not rebooting, but you're making new Muppet movies, they're doing pretty well for themselves, I assume there's another one in the works, hopefully. Um, why not expand on that part of the park? Uh, my other answer will sound like a cop-out because it is one of my favorite lands, but I do truly believe that Tomorrowland has a lot of potential for expansion. I think um, Buzz Lightyear is ready to go. I think Stitch is ready to go. Uh, I think the Tomorrowland Speedway not only is ready to go, but has a ton of space associated with it that could put in multiple smaller attractions. So I think we could really do a reboot of Tomorrowland um, especially with a uh, Tomorrowland movie coming out, isn't that the perfect time to sort of breathe some new life into it? Uh, if you want more details as to how I would change those things, I have a series called Revisiting Disney where I go to each attraction separately and just talk about how I would personally want to see Disney either revamp it or refurbish it or replace it completely. And I've already covered Buzz, uh, and I think I'll in the future cover Stitch and, and the Tomorrowland Speedway. But yeah, it's a really fun series. I enjoy it a lot. You should check it out. Anyway, great question, and moving on. Disney World Genius, this is a great question, asked, do you have any books about Michael Eisner you can tell me about so I could read them? Yes, I have two books that I can teach you about, uh, three books about um, uh, Michael Eisner that are worth reading, I think. Here we sing along The Living Seas. The first one, I'm gonna do them in order of least to most recommended. The, the first one and the least recommended one is called The Work in Progress. And it is by, quote unquote, Michael Eisner. It's his autobiography. It, I put those in quotes because I'm pretty sure he had a um, ghostwriter who helped him out. Uh, and it's my least recommended because while it does give some good insight into his life before Disney, um, it is very biased. It's his autobiography. He's going to cover all of these controversial parts of his career at Disney uh, very one-sidedly like for instance the whole issues between him and Jeffrey Katzenberg when Katzenberg left are sort of written off as just like a little fight when they were like a major problem with Disney and and what he was doing with the company so uh, I think it's worth reading for context but I don't think you should treat it as like a definitive source of what his tenure was like at Disney next up is a book by uh, called Keys of the Kingdom and I unfortunately cannot think of for the life of me who wrote it uh, but it is essentially a shorter book that sort of tries to more um, tries to cover his his tenure a little more uh, objectively. However, in my experience, it seemed a little too heavy-handed against him. It was a little too harsh against him, and it sort of doesn't really expand very well on a lot of major parts of his career there. But it was it was an interesting read. It was it was a good follow-up for my f number one. Uh, uh, recommended book if you want to learn more about Eisner and his time at the Disney Company, and it's called Disney World, and it's by James P Disney World <laughs> Disney War, and it's by James P. Stewart, and it covers pretty extensively his his tenure at Disney. It covers it from I think when he was 
first got himself into the company, and of course it covers a little bit before him and, you know, before he was, like, working at Disney, uh, up until I believe he was forced out of Disney, or if not, it was right before he was forced out. And in my experience, it is the most objective take of his uh, career there at Disney. It talks a lot about, about the bad decisions he's made and all of the bad he's done for the company, but it also talks about all of the great things he did for the company and how he saved it sort of in the 80s when he first picked it up. Uh, it's kind of a long read. It's the bigger of the three books, but I think it is 100% worth reading, not just for anybody interested in Eisner, but anybody who's interested in Disney. It really encapsulates the, you know, uh, decade of Disney, quote unquote, what they called it in the 90s when there was sort of this revitalization of the company. Um, just keep in mind, though, uh, it is about it is a book about a company, not a book about like a magic factory, you know, and I don't say that to sound like um, uh, snotty about it. What I mean to say is they're going to talk a lot in that book about movies that we have come to grow to love for their characters and their story. But at the end of the day, this is a book about a company. So what they're going to talk about isn't, you know, the magic of Pocahontas or the characters or how much how beautiful the art is. They're going to talk about how much it grossed, how well it did overseas and what that meant for the company's bottom line and how that sort of, you know, form the directions it would take into the future. And that's just one example. But I mean, that's sort of the take that it's it has. And I found that very interesting. Disney War by James P. B. Stewart. Definitely recommend it for any Disney fan out there looking to read more about the company. Next question comes from Jakey Juran. It says, two quick questions. One, can you walk between the parks on MC Magic? I imagine you can, but you never know. And two, where would you want to leave a legacy? Brick at MK entrance, a picture at Epcot, a leaf at AK entrance, or wherever it is at Hollywood Studios. Uh, thanks and have a great week. So to answer your first one, I think so. I think certain parks like Animal Kingdom have a closed off entrance, so you might not be able to walk there, but they're all existing on the same Minecraft map. So uh, I know, because you can take the monorail from uh, the Magic Kingdom to Epcot in real time. So you could theoretically just walk along that path and just be a super long walk. What I'm most excited about when it comes to MC Magic, as nerdy as this is gonna sound, is all of the stuff in between the parks. Like, they've got the four parks, they're working on the water parks, it's gonna be a lot of fun, but when they get like a road system in place, and it'll, for me, tie it all together and make it truly feel like an actual recreation of that whole land as opposed to like the parts that we all know and love. So I'm excited for that, and I will probably walk from park to park at some point. As for your second question, I would have really loved to leave a legacy outside of the MK uh, or Epcot. Two of those would be fine for me. I actually don't want to leave a legacy for myself. I remember a couple of years ago, I really wanted to leave a legacy for my late mother, who, you know, I have to attribute my love of Disney to. It was a big part of why we were going to Disney so often was because when she was younger, she would go to Disney a lot. And I don't think they have any running Leave a Legacy programs anymore, but the second they open one up, um, I think my sister and I are going to get together and leave a legacy in her name. And then hopefully one day, maybe someone will leave a legacy in my name. I don't know. I'm not interested in leaving my own legacy. I just want to, I would rather do it for her. Uh, next question comes from Louis... Speziali, uh, Speziali, I'm sorry, I ruined that name, I'm sorry, I'm doing it once every episode. Uh, I have a question for you, do you think the idea of Disney Infinity 2.0 is crazy making people buy another starter pack to play? Interesting question, I, uh, my answer is no, I don't think so, I don't think it's crazy, and here's why. So if you haven't heard, Disney Infinity 2.0 is coming out in September, it is an upgrade to 1.0, it is coming with a Marvel starter pack, and they are selling it as a $75 starter pack. Comes with uh, the characters, the play pack, or the play set, the base, and then the, the disc. And uh, as far as I can tell, they are eventually going to offer just the, uh, the Marvel play set, but uh, it seems like they're not going to now. Here's the reason why I don't think it's crazy. For one, it's an upgrade of the game, right? It's an upgrade of the platform, so it's coming with the disc. And if you've played Rock Band or uh, Guitar Hero, this is sort of a similar situation we've got going on here, where hopefully the game is enhanced enough that you need that new content, so you're buying the disc anyway, right? And in theory, you're gonna be buying these new characters, right? So $75, a new video game costs $60 here in the United States. So now that's $15 over the normal price. And you're getting, what, two characters and a play set, and so I apologize for the sound. Somebody's working out outside. Um, so you're getting, for $15, the base and the toys, 
the two like figurines and then the playset. I think split up, that's a not a bad deal. In fact, I think if you want to argue it a certain way, like I have a, the power pad, I don't need another power pad. I do want to play on the PlayStation 4, so I'm going to need the disc anyway. But even if I was keeping it on the 360, the idea is the content is different enough, or at least hopefully it's different enough, that you're going to need that disc. So I think that cost is pretty justified, and when you think about it, I'm paying $60 for the disc, and then I'm paying an extra $15 for two characters in a playset, which is actually a steal if you consider how much they sell for separately. The way I look at it, and this is just how I'm personally breaking it down for my own mentality, is that I'm not paying for that redundant power pad that I'm not really going to need or use. Uh, it's just sort of thrown in there. Uh, but, you know, that's sort of what happens. The real deciding factor will be whether or not there is enough new content or new gameplay. Oh, there, dang it, there we go. We're trying to clean up the parts here. No, keep it. Keep it. No, keep it. There we go. Aw, oh, they're just playing around with it. <laughs> um, I think it'll really depend on how different 2.0 is from 1.0. That'll be the big deciding factor, and we're going to have to wait and see. Maybe there'll be not a lot changed, and then, yeah, it is kind of crazy that they make you buy a new whole game disc, but uh, we're just going to have to let time tell there. Uh, and then, finally, our main question, our last main question for this week comes from Aaron, who asks... I heard that the opening day of Disneyland was a huge disaster. Is it true? If so, how? Thanks and have a great week. Well, Aaron, it is true. The opening day of Disneyland back in 1955 was a disaster. Um, the short of it is that they were just very unprepared for how popular it was going to be. And just more, not Moore's Law, uh, Murphy's Law, anything bad that could happen ended up happening. So let's just name a few of the things that were... Uh, problematic about the Disneyland launch. One, uh, ticket counterfeiting was running rampant that day, so the parks were overcrowded because a lot of people who illegitimately were entering the parks were sort of crowding it up, and that sort of added to a lot of other problems that the parks saw that day. They were running out of food, they were running out of soft drinks, they just weren't prepared for the idea of like the lunch rush, everyone eating at the same time. Uh, the parks were just freshly finished, and it was extremely hot. There are stories um, from Imagineers who talk about how um, women's heels were sinking into the pavement because it was so soft, because it was so fresh. Um, rides were breaking down because they had not been stress tested. It was just like an overall, yeah, it was a super big mess. And part of that reasoning was because they decided to open like right the most prime time ever. It was like dead of summer on like I think a weekend or it was yeah it was like during what was supposed to be one of the most popular days and it's because they wanted a big launch and they got a big launch it just seemed like they weren't fully ready for a big launch and it was a learning experience you also have to remember Disneyland was the first ever theme park there were amusement parks there were carnivals but there was never a theme park before Disneyland and so they were really trying out something completely new there and you know credit to them they eventually ironed out a lot of the problems um but f what's funny is that that became a very um potent lesson for Disney as a company when it came to Disney World they did the exact opposite they chose the least popular day they could to launch Disney World they opened it uh, like during a weekday in October, which was like not, you know, the season to do it. They wanted a very small launch because they thought we're in this for the long run. We don't want to have this catastrophic launch like last time. And it went off a lot smoother. In fact, it was pretty tame. But after about a month, um, it 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 picked up and became super popular for like that sort of Thanksgiving season. What's funny is they were anticipating it to be like Disneyland anyway. They were afraid uh, that it was going to be super packed and crowded and it was going to be just as nightmarish as Disneyland was. The funny story I remember reading from Reality Land, the story of the Disney World building, was how they had people in helicopters who saw this just endless stream of cars and they're like, oh my gosh, they're all coming. This is just as bad as we thought it was going to be. And then they all turned off on the exit and they realized, oh wait, these are all just the employees of Disney World who are coming to work. Um... And then the park itself had a pretty tame and relaxed launch. And the problem was that was sort of what they wanted. But the press saw that and goes, ooh, Disney World opening flopped. Not a ton of people showed up. It wasn't super exciting. But Disney liked that. And again, towards the end of the month, it really ramped up. It became popular. Um, more rides opened. And it just, the rest is history. Uh, yeah, if you want to know more about the opening of Disney World, and it sort of references the opening of Disneyland, you should check out... Um, uh, Reality Land by David C 
Koenig? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's K-O something. I should put it in the comments. Uh, people should bug me to put it in the description if I forget, because I'll probably forget. Uh, anyway, now we've got what I like to call the lightning round, which are shorter questions that I think have shorter answers. But first, I want to uh, thank you all for joining me. If you want to follow me on my social networks, I'm at Rob Plays on Twitter. I'm Rob Plays That Game on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm also Rob Plays That Game on Twitch, and I do some streaming, some Minecraft, some not Minecraft. Um, hopefully, you can check that out. Uh, and if you have a question for me to ask, answer, uh, just leave it in the comments below, and I'll try to get to them either, you know, in the comments themselves or on an episode or in a future episode. So, uh, yeah, if you got anything picking your brain, throw it out there. And even if I can't answer it, sometimes somebody else can. Anyway, lightning round. Let's get going. The Disney lover Du Bois Dubois asks, Hey, Rob, I read that Disney is one of the worst companies to work for. Do you believe this is true? This is the lightning round question? What did I do? Um... First off, no, I do not think it's true. I think that's exaggeration. I think anybody who thinks that Disney is one of the worst companies to work for is being hyperbolic and needs to look at some countries outside, uh, some companies outside the country that have some really horrific conditions and working conditions. So I don't think uh, it is the worst at all. I do think there's a lot of improvement that could be had in how they treat their employees and how they compensate their employees. And it is by no means a perfect company. I think a lot of that comes with the troubles of how do you properly run one of the biggest entertainment companies in the entire world and keep shareholders happy and i think a lot of that comes from the fact that when you're a public company you're sort of you have to answer to these shareholders and so sometimes the decisions you make to make them happy aren't good in the long run for employees so yeah there's definitely room for improvement there are definitely horror stories of people uh working at disney but there are also a lot of great stories of people who love it and treasure it and it's going to be like that with any company uh, but definitely not like the worst or one of the worst. It also depends on what you're doing. I've had friends who work for um, Disney um, companies that Disney owns, subsidiaries. I've had people who work for Disney directly. I've had people I know who work in the theme parks, and they all have different stories. So it all very much varies widely. Uh, next question comes from, are you keep chopping online? If Disney was to make an official social network, Besides Disney.com, what would it be? Would it be a news website or a dating website? Or or this also doesn't include the Disney boards. Uh, I mean, the short answer is it would probably be an, a Facebook clone. But I don't think you'll ever, ever see a Disney social network made by Disney. I think the world we live in is one that is so interconnected to things like Twitter and Facebook and all those things I just plugged a minute ago that Disney would just tie into that. They wouldn't make their own. I think they're wise enough to realize that as big of a company as they are, they can't rival any of those, so there's no point in trying. There is a um, unofficial one called DCOT, D-COT, which is like a Disney social network. Let you people put up their like trip photos, and it's Disney centric. And what they've got that's really cool is a jukebox that has tons of Disney music and loops that you can listen to. Um, that's really cool. You might want to check that out. And then finally, our final question <laughs> that's a little redundant comes from Jimmy and Kona, who asks, What do you think about wait times for the new Seven Dwarfs ride? It's 920 Eastern here, and the line is already 90 minutes. Keep up the good work. Uh, one, I'm super jealous that you're in Disney World and you're online for Seven Dwarfs Minecart Train. Uh, two, I think it's normal. It's a new ride. It's going to be popular. It's what people are going to come to the parks for. It's going to be like that for a while. And then eventually something else newer will come around and sort of steal that thunder. And that's just sort of how the whole process works. Uh, there's not much you could do about it outside of what Disney is already doing about it, which is trying to implement things like interactive queues to keep you busy or Fast Pass and Fast Pass Plus to sort of... Uh, alleviate and spread out that stress on the line but at the end of the day you know it's a good sign it means the ride's popular and it's something that they're probably going to have to keep doing uh, anyway thanks again for everybody who watched I hope you all have a great week whatever you're doing make the most of it because it makes it that much better and I hope you all uh, get to join me next time for the next Disney World Q&A bye everybody <laughs>